Hey there, Vintage Audio fans. Look what I have. This was brought to me by a customer wanting me to take a look at it. It's a Sea Breeze record player. So we're going to do a little overhaul on this thing. This thing's going to be a, probably a one tube uh, mono amplifier. We're going to do a little bit of a work on this thing and see if we can uh, make it work. I've already uh, plugged it in and taken a listen to it. It hums. So it doesn't know the words, in other words. So we're going to teach it the words here. I have a feeling it's going to be a capacitor that's failed in the primary B-plus power supply, which could be a challenge because this is going to be a high-voltage capacitor. And, uh, well, I haven't opened one of these things up in years. In fact, I had one of these things about 50 years ago. That shows how old this thing is. We're going to get uh, we're going to get to the bottom of this and uh, film the results and uh, let you see what we find wrong with it. I might note to open this up. It's just a matter of undoing these funky bolts. They're just all held together. They're like uh, they're 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 thumb screws basically. They're not they're not tight. You just unscrew them. This whole piece should just lift. Probably need two hands for this, but this whole piece should just lift straight out, just like that. We can turn it over. This is a little gem we're after here. This is the amplifier module. And as you can see, as I thought, it has one tube, and that's going to be a triode. And I, I, I'm going to bet that the tube is okay. Out in front here we've got our audio output transformer and our speaker on the front. The power supply, the high voltage, basically goes through these wires on their way to the plate of the tube. And how a vacuum tube operates, this is being a triode, being the very simplest of vacuum tubes, is you've got a a heated cathode which is held at ground potential and you've got your grid your grid goes to your phono pickup and the plate the high voltage is placed on the plate and the signal that is presented to the grid causes electrons to either be attracted towards the or emitted from the hot cathode in other words they fly towards the uh, high positive voltage on the plate and cause the plate voltage to drop and that is how a tube amplifies and that voltage fluctuation is induced into the output transformer which is then transformed down to the low impedance uh, uh, speaker voltage so we're going to take this amplifier apart and see what's wrong with it I don't know if you can see that but this is the tube it's a 25 L6 which would make it a tetrode and it's looking at the grid design of it here it's a beam uh, power beam tetrode tube uh, not to be confused with the 6L6 which was a much higher power tube this is a low power electron tube made in Canada General Electric this is an original new old stock this tube is probably you know I don't know what year this was made but it could easily be 50 or more years old um, don't know if there's a date on this thing uh, I can see if there's a date code on this this old Seabreeze record player. Anyway, the tube we already know is probably okay. So I'm about to tear apart the amplifier to see where the problem really lies. I just removed the tube from it because I want to put the tube for safekeeping. I don't want to damage it while I'm working on it because this is going to be one rare beast to try and replace this. So now we're looking at the guts of this ridiculously simple amplifier. And remember I said the transformer, one side of the transformer is going to be hooked to the plate. That's going to be this guy here. And this other one here is going to be hooked to the power supply. And sure enough it is. It's connected to the red wire. This is a, there's, a, there's a three capacitors inside this one. It's a paper condenser, but there's three capacitors inside here. And uh, I just have to look at the microfarads and the voltage. It looks to be all 150 working volts. DC and it looks like there's going to be like a 30, 60 or an 80 microfarad. Um, they've got a 
I've got a metal band around it here to hold it in place. I can't read the value of the third one, but there is three capacitors in there. And I could replace this capacitor if I wanted to, but I think probably what I'll do is I'll just bridge another one in parallel with it. Um, this one here is a bypass capacitor. This one here shouldn't be a problem. It's going to be it's going to be this big one here. There's not much else in here. We've got one, two, three resistors, uh, a, a selenium rectifier. It looks like and that would be normal because silicon hadn't been invented at that point. And the volume control. These wires coming down here. This is coming from the phono pickup. One side goes to ground. One side goes to the loud side of the volume control through a capacitor, of course, so it's isolated. And the wiper, this gray lead off here is going to go to the grid of the uh, amplifier tube. As you turn up and down the volume, this will increase the volume going to the amplifier tube from the pickup. And that's pretty much it. These resistors are just used to bias the tube, to bias the grid on the tube, and it's a pretty, pretty simple circuit. And this should be a very easy fix for this uh, particular unit. Now what a lot of people don't realize these days is it's not hard to find high voltage capacitors. In fact, you can find them just about anywhere. In this case, a primary filter capacitor to a switching power supply. 22 microfarads, 400 volts. I'm sure that's going to be plenty high enough to uh, give us uh, enough filtration to reduce the hum or eliminate it. So we're going to pull this capacitor out and I'm going to bridge it over the uh, two capacitors one at a time to see which side of this big one is blown and uh, That'll tell us right away whether we've got the problem solved Then I can go in and replace the actual cap or in, my, in this case I think I'm just going to bridge a new one over top of it and that'll be more than sufficient to restore this old beauty back to service and hey, we just found a date We just found a date November 10th, 1958 is when this old beauty was born. So this thing is uh, 50, uh, about 53 years old. No, 55 years old, sorry. It's 2013. So 55 year old unit. Gonna be restored here today in my little garage base shop. Hell, this thing's older than I am. <laughs> so what I've done here is I've bridged the main capacitor and I'm going to turn the power on here. Oh, look at that. It's humming. I knew that was gonna happen because I already had it warmed up. So that capacitor is not the one that's causing the problem. So we're gonna bridge the next capacitor. Before we do that, we have to make sure that we discharge all the residual voltages otherwise this thing could present quite a nice shock hazard to me unlike solid state components um, tube gear tends to hold its charge for a while so we're going to discharge the capacitors the next thing i'm going to go over is i'm going to do either the blue one or the yellow one i haven't quite decided which one yet but we'll, we'll try them one at a time one of these has got to be the fault as you can see now i've bridged it onto the yellow capacitor the yellow side the yellow lead damn diesel trucks and it's still humming so obviously it's not that one so we'll we'll move on we'll try the next one so I'm going to take the capacitor and discharge it touching it to ground okay I was I was right initially it was the main uh, B plus capacitor but what had happened is my jumper lead had come undone from my my test capacitor. There's the ground disconnected. We connect it up. So it is this filter capacitor that's gone. It's the red lead, which is the main B plus supply. So we're going to take this little capacitor here that we've got, and we're going to install it in the circuit. And maybe I'll put two of them in parallel because the um, microfarads on this is not quite as as big as the original one. So we want to have capacity at least as big as the original. I'm going to go try and find another one. So as I began my search for some higher voltage capacitors, I was thinking computer power supply would be a good place to start. But then I remembered these. This is an inverter from a compact fluorescent bulb, which 
I had the misfortune of dropping and breaking. So I contaminated my garage with some mercury. But I got a perfectly good inverter and 22 microfarads, 200 volts. And I need a 60 and a 30. A 60 and a 30, yeah, okay. I think a couple of these will probably probably be sufficient and I've got this other one here so I'm gonna I'm gonna pair all these capacitors across this thing and um, that should give me enough microfarads to uh, get rid of that AC hum and restore this unit back to like new operation so now the moment of truth I have um, replaced three capacitors here here are my new ones I bridged two in parallel to give me 44 microfarads and it is attached to the B plus line. Now we're going to turn on this thing. There we go. We have power. We have no humming. Well, we have some humming. I think I have to better find a better ground point. Well, there we have it. I had a bad ground point. Um, if I disconnect this ground lead, you can hear the hum. Right. So there's our, our capacitors that we've added. There's three of them in here. I connected two of them in parallel, as they're 22 microfarad each. So that gives me a total of 44 microfarads on the B-plus line, and another 22 microfarads in parallel with this other one that's just about shot, but uh, that's giving us more than enough... Um, more than enough uh, filtration for this little single tube amplifier that we've got here and uh, I just have to connect the ground wire up to the ground I initially attached it to the chassis and then realized that that's actually not the isolated ground this is uh, the actual chassis itself is not the the ground point and it was still kind of humming so we're gonna run a ground wire in and uh, then put this back together and test it out One thing I always do when I'm working with electronics, especially when I'm dealing with any type of high voltage electronics, I always want to make sure I use heat shrink tubing to cover up any junction points in the wire. So that's what this blue tubing is here. And I'll just place that over top of my solder connection. And then we'll get a little lighter out here and we'll shrink it down. And then this heat shrink tubing now will form a nice solid um, bond over top of this junction protect it from any accidental short circuit circuiting because it does, it is going to have a metal can over top of it even though this is a ground wire the ground here is not the same potential as the metal case it's uh, the, it's the negative supply or the negative line for the power supply but the negative line for the power supply is not chassis ground and if it does short out that's going to make this thing hum. And you know what a record player that hums, you know what the problem with that is, right? It doesn't know the words. Good luck restoring your old vintage record players and amplifiers. It's a fascinating hobby. Just to see how things were done 55 years ago. Pretty simple by today's standards, I might say. And here's a piece of advice if you're buying a camcorder. Do not buy one of these little micro-sized JVC pieces of junk. It's so bloody hard to hold and your fingers get touching buttons that you don't want to touch. Anyway, I'm just going to put the rivet back in here. This is just like a little metal clip. And this is used to hold together. Rather than put screws in here, they just put these little brass or these little copper clips in. that just punch into a hole in the chassis and that's what holds the unit together. I've already done that to the top one here as you can see. I'm just going to put the bottom one in and then we're going to put this thing together and play a record on it and see how it sounds. Okay, we're just going to try this thing out here. Just going to press the automatic the reject button. And this should drop the record, which it's done. And
Not bad for a piece of equipment that's 55 years old. Wonderful.